Hello everyone. Welcome to today's technical training session. This one is going to be on mastering robot control with programming sensors. I have with me, I'm Stephanie with First Global. I have with me um, Noah and Matt from Rev Robotics. Oh. Um, so today's topics are going to be based on the questions you've already submitted through the form. Um, starting last week, I think we had a few days for that. Uh, for using the chat, we ask that you please focus your questions on a topic currently being discussed. Um, if you want to ask a follow-up question or dive a little bit deeper into it, um, we won't be able to get to all new questions in the chat. So just uh, we ask that you please keep it to what the guys are talking about. And with that, I think we're ready to go. Noah, Mac? All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're happy to be here. Uh, so Noah is over in our studio here in Texas. I'm in one of our conference rooms kind of calling in. So Noah has a little bit of a robot that's set up with a few sensors as well as the programming window. Um, and we're going to try to tackle as many of the questions uh, that have came through uh, the form as we possibly can uh, in the time that we have allotted. So with that, let's kind of get started. I think this is actually probably a really good question to start Noah off with before we even start digging into a lot of the specific application examples. But, but one of the big questions that seems to be coming from a number of people is, what are the benefits and drawbacks of using each programming language and which ones would you recommend for different types of people, like as they're getting started, maybe as they've had more experience um, in somewhere in between? Yeah, sure. So blocks, you know, it's, a, it's a nice, easy way to get started. Um, you know, yeah, you have all the things that you can do right in front of you in the blocks. You can browse visually all the things you can do. Um, it's a good way to get used to a lot of the concepts of programming. Um, once you However, once you start doing more complex programs, you'll kind of start to feel like it's clumsy to click around and navigate and drag between a big spread out, sprawled out program. And once you start getting to that point, um, you know, if, you are, if you're not already interested in learning a textual language, um, you certainly can stay with blocks. But uh, if you have the inclination, that might be a good time to start researching how to program in Java, um, for example, or if you're not using, you know, the first software in particular, whatever programming language of your choice. Um, and speaking of those different programming languages, so within the controller currently, there is blocks on bot Java, uh, and then with certain versions of the application, you're able to utilize Android Studio to build your own Java library. So for first global, it has been primarily on bot Java and blocks mainly as it's a better way and it's an easier way for us here at Rev and also with First Global to provide support for the program. So if anyone is running into issues, it's a lot easier for us to be able to debug those things since we have people that are coming from all across the globe to participate in the program. It's easier to get folks trained um, and not have to deal with a lot of a number of edge cases that can pop up when you start to expand your programming knowledge. Um, one of the other things that was one of the big questions was around uh, what language options are, is, are there being looked into and explored to be doing expansion. And this is actually something that we talk about a lot at Rev, um, is what we're going to be doing in the future and what's going to be coming down within the next like three to five years as we continue to grow and build off of things like the Control Hub. Uh, but we are actively looking at different language options that we can end up building in to kind of make that transition process uh, a little bit easier as we're kind of going through. Uh, with that, the, the language options that at least like Noah made, made a mention of like blocks, that's gonna be what we're gonna utilize a lot of the stuff when we're doing uh, the application examples today is gonna be a lot of it is gonna be in the block interface. Um, for me, the really big thing with blocks is that it starts to teach you the, the basics and the logic structure. And it's really difficult to build things that break. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, that's one of the downsides of using a text-based language is uh, like unlike in a language class, if you happen to put a punctuation mark in the wrong location, a human being can read that and understand that maybe it needed to go someplace else. A computer will just throw an exception and just say like, nope, this is all, this is all broken, we're done, we're going home. Like, and then you have to, that's when debugging becomes a bigger, a bigger thing. So uh, th those are some of the things that you can kind of go from there. Uh, so Noah, how about, we, uh, how about we actually kind of do a little bit, before we get like digging into each of the individual sensors and some of the things, because I know we have like a number of questions around using color sensors, touch sensors, two meter distance sensors, getting robots to drive straight. There's a lot of questions around like, how do we actually get into the nitty gritty? Um, 
How about we actually talk a little bit about just sensors more broadly and in general and what's available. So on the control hub yourself on itself, we have digital analog and I squared C sensors that are available. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the major differences are between T and these? Sure. So the big difference with I squared C, I'll talk about I squared C set, uh, later, but the nice thing about digital and analog sensors is that you don't need any special support from, from, uh, from the application to be able to use them. They're all the same. A digital sensor just tells you, it says either yes or no. A uh, touch sensor, am I pressed or am I not pressed? You know, a, a magnetic limit switch. Is there a, magnetic he a magnet here or is there no magnet here? Um, with analog, it gives you a range of values. On the control hub, because it's a 3.3 volt based system, it's uh, in the range of 0 to 3.3. Um, so it's just a voltage. So, and then the sensor documentation will tell you what that means. So for a potentiometer, it just means that it's somewhere in that range. Um, for, a, uh, for other sensors, it, you might have to do some kind of extra conversion step. Um, but that, that can all be done easily within your code without having to have special support for that sensor added to the, uh, to the SDK. Yeah. And, and the really big thing, too, is like one of the questions that kind of came up as well is talking about, like, are there other sensors that we can use with the hub that are not necessarily just mm -hmm. rev sensors? Like, we can get these from our local area. Digital and analog sensors are really easy to use with the control hub or an expansion hub as well. Um, and you just configure them as a base analog sensor or as a base digital sensor. Um, with that, you're going to need to do a little bit more homework because you have to read the data sheet for the sensor as well as some of the documentation for the control hub to make sure that you make the right wiring harnesses, that it's getting enough power. Um, but you can connect some of those other ones away or, or, or connect those together themselves. You don't necessarily uh, need to have any special support from Rev or from anyone with First Global. You could just kind of plug them in as long as they're 3.3 volt sensors. It's fairly easy to utilize them. So that's yep. one thing where you can kind of grow and tinker uh, in your own little, uh, as, as the, we're trying to find ways of continuing to explore these topics uh, without having a com competitive season, uh, there might be some location or some places that are local to you that you can uh, find sensors and other things that you could utilize with the control hub itself. Um, one of the other questions that ended up coming up was like the basic of how an encoder would work. So the encoder ports on the, control hub are actually separate from, uh, and the expansion hub are actually separate from the other sensor ports. And mainly this is because, uh, as Noah kind of said, that uh, digital sensors basically are yes or no, they're on or off, they are magnetic field is here or it's not, for example, with the magnetic limit switch. Uh, with an encoder, it's basically doing that, but it's doing it rapidly. So it's sending out, a, it's like yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and basically you count every single time it does that. And there are multiple channels uh, that are basically being read simultaneously to be able to know the direction, the velocity, and other things. Uh, the one cool thing about a lot of the products that come in the first global kit is that encoders are actually put uh, on the back of all the motors. So you're able to have access to that already, which can then get into some more complicated control theory, which Noah knows a little bit better than more than anybody else. But we'll talk about some of that stuff a little bit later. Um, I think we yeah. kind of we kind of didn't talk too much about I squared C, but I think we can get into that a little bit a little I mean, bit yeah, later. Yeah, I, I think too. okay, that's fine. Uh, the other cool thing about encoders, though, is you know he talked about how you can count. Um, you you have to count all of the uh, readings that are coming from an encoder, but the control hub or expansion hub actually does all of that for you. So when you're using it, all you have to do is say, hey, how many ticks has the motor gone, or how fast is the motor going, and it'll just give you a result. It does all the counting for you. Yeah. Which, which is a little bit different than like other control systems or control outfits that you might have. Like if you have access to like an Arduino that happens to have that, you might mm -hmm. need to do your own code stack up to be able to count all those ticks and being able to kind of get that together where the hub just does it for you um, itself, which makes it actually really, really easy to build relatively complex controls, which is kind of cool. Uh, the other, the other thing as well to kind of keep in mind is like there's, there's some questions also where like around like when's a good time to use certain sensors. So like, uh, a good use for like a magnetic limit switch. Noah, do you have any suggestions on when's a good time to use a magnetic sure. limit switch? Sure. I, I, I saw a few questions in there about magnetic limit switches, and people seem to not really understand what, how they're useful. I saw someone actually said, um, you know, there wasn't really a use for it in the game. 
The magnetic limit switch is not a sensor that is gain specific in any way. It is to your robot. So, um, for example, if you had a lift and um, you wanted to make sure that it did not, that you want to know where you were. So let's say there were three stages that you want to be able to drive to. Um, you can just, you can use that. So like, so again, there, it's a digital sensor, so it just says, is there a magnet here or is there not a magnet here? So, um, you know, if the middle limit switch says, yeah, I detect a magnet, then that, then you know you're there and you just have to, uh, maybe it's probably good to apply some, a level of motor power to keep it there. Um, since otherwise it'll fall, um, it, and if it's at the t and if it's if you want to go to the top, you just say m you turn on the motor hot faster, so it'll actually start climbing. And then once it reaches the top, you then turn it down to g again to keep it at that at that level. Um, uh, same thing for the bottom, of course. So that's really where the magnetic li limit switch is useful. Uh, you can use it for all sorts of robot mechanisms. Um, it is not designed for interaction with the game field, rather between components of your robot. Really, I think an underrated sensor. Yeah, and there's there's also like a number of things that you're able to do, like Noah mentioned, an arm or a lift. You could use it on arms as well to detect different locations. Uh, basically, it's anywhere that you would use like a touch sensor. Uh, that it's not like a physical bump, but like if you were to use it as like a limit, basically anything that you would use as a limit. So you want to know that it's hit a point. But you don't want to have contact. That's a really good place of being able to use mm -hmm. it. So, like last year's game, for example, uh, the climb at the end, you wanted to know that you were at zero, or your lift was up high enough, and you just wanted to run it until it right. stopped. You could you could do that, and then just power it all the way back down and climb at the end. Um, so that's another kind of useful uh, use case there. Yeah, um, and we'll probably uh, we'll, we're later we're going to talk about um, some state machine stuff, and I'll probably get a little more into the specifics of how you would program that then. Um, but yeah, like for example, y y um, if you're at the bottom level, you can program your robot to say, w w you know, whatever input you might be getting from the driver, don't let it, don't drive it down, make sure that it only can go up. And you can look at this current state of the sensor to make decisions like that. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of different ways that you're able to kind of go about that. And also it will make it easier for you to be able to drive teleoperator. Because one of the things that was kind of mentioned was, you know, what's the use of this, this, wasn't, this wasn't a direct question that was in the thing, but it, we've had this conversation with teams before where it's like, well, what's, what is the point of programming when everything is teleoperated? There's no autonomous mode, so we don't need to program, basically. It's kind of like the thought process. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things you're able to do to make it easier for you to have one or two drivers being able to work together to um, solve the problem. Uh, so that's one thing to kind of keep in mind uh, as we're moving, as you're kind of moving through a challenge and trying to find solutions to that problem. So no, I think I think right now what we could do is actually start to do a little bit of digging in and try yeah. to do a little bit of programming um, and kind of get that together. Uh, we had a number of questions that were all on the color sensor. Uh, so can we, I think that maybe that's one of the ones that we kind of start with is we can look at the color sure. sensor itself. All yeah. Right. Um, uh, so, but yeah, let's, oh, get, okay. let's get started from there. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I'm actually not going to dig super into the code right now, um, though I'll pull up a, why is that not, that's weird. Is it not, okay, yeah, that's why. Did not set, I, somehow the configuration got deactivated. Um, so pro tip, if you're in blocks and you're like, why aren't my sensors showing up? Make sure that on your driver station, it says your name of your configuration here and not no configuration selected. Um, that, that will cause that issue. Because what blocks are actually listed under for your devices is depends on what's been you've put into your configuration. So when you're doing blocks, the first step to use a new sensor is always to configure it. Um, same for motors. OK. So, so we have a color sensor. Um, and so pretty much we have, the, ma the main one that you care about is this get normal, uh, actually no. Um, actually I'm, I'm gonna, so there, 
there, uh, there's this co rev color range sensor and then color sensor. Um, I kind of recommend using the color sensor one. Um, so what, what you can do here is get this ARGB. Um, and then under, uh, I think, utilities and then color, Uh, well, okay. So uh, really what you want to do is um, use this block and then let's see. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. Regardless of the of the color sensor, um, specific blocks. Really, really the thing to know about it is things like lighting. Um, and right now that's not a soup. So right now I'm using actually um, a version of the FTC software that's not out yet. It's 5 at 5. It should be out very, very soon. Um, you should probably be using uh, the FTC software, not the first global software for now, because we've done so lots of updates since then. And obviously, since we don't have a first global season this year, that software hasn't been updated. Um, but anyway, uh, in, not in this version, but in 6.0 that will be coming before the first tech challenge kept kickoff, um, the, in particular, the Rev V3 color sensor is going to have uh, a new capability where you can set the, uh, set the gain. So if your color sensor is uh, at an at a incorrect brightness, like, like if, if, the, if your environment is brighter at the competition than, you, than at home, you can test that at home and um, see that when, when those colors get maxed out, you'll be able to turn down the gain so that you have reusable colors again. Um, the color sensor is definitely an, uh, an a thing we're actively working on. Um, yeah, so and there's, and there's and a couple of different ways you can do it in blocks. And one of the part of the reason I got a little confused there was that actually got changed a little bit in uh, in the 5.5 software. So, um, yep. Yeah, and so with with the with the improvements that are being made within the SDK, a lot of the stuff. The nice thing with the control hub is it is used in kind of multiple different programs, which then has the software can continue to involve regardless of if it is with the first global comp around the first global competitions or if it is around the ones for the first tech challenge and we're able to continue to iterate and work on things one of the portions that we kind of talked about when we started doing the intro with sensors was you know digital and analog are really really easy i squared c uses drivers so right. it's similar to what would be like on your computer right your computer your mouse uses a driver uh, uh, to be able to you be utilized through either windows or or Mac software or Linux, uh, and you're able to basically change the driver behavior, which then can end up adding uh, usability down the line. So with I, so I squared C gives that type of ability to kind of iterate to make mm -hmm. more features being able to be built into the SDK to make it a little bit easier. Um, one of the typical ways that is being used for a color sensor I, though at least the past in the past is it's usually been like there's like two objects right like one is uh, one color and the other one is another color do you have any like tips on uh, how how to kind of set up you know if you have like maybe two or three objects that you're looking for that are maybe really different colors like one's red and one's blue and one's like yellow as an example yeah definitely that's that's a great point um, so you really don't want to be looking for a specific color number values because that that can change under lighting that can change on your gain value that you know there's all sorts of things that can affect that really what you want to do with colors and object detection in particular is to say is this more red or is this more blue for example like do a, a relative comparison um, uh, which colors with you know which sub colors you know red green blue are stronger than others um, or if you have the luxury of being able to sense both like multiple objects and you know one of them is one color and uh, the other is the other, then you can compare those and that's even nicer. Um, but yeah, as much as possible, you don't want to hard code in, you know, I'm looking for this shade. The color sensor is not great at that. It's far better at relative, um, relative de uh, determination. Yeah, so, it, so usually a best practice, at least when you're using it for competitive robotics, is trying to find... Uh, 
try to find some of the maximums that you kind of go there. One of the things that at least we take into consideration when we're designing games uh, is actually the colors that are being utilized. So typically either, you know, like for example, last year's first global challenge had two game balls that were both orange and both just differences in size. So if you wanted to detect them, you could detect a game object basically the same type of way. Uh, but if there is any element that you needed to know the difference in coloration, usually it is something drastic. It would be like a red to a blue versus needing to determine between two different shades of blue right. as an example. Yeah, yeah. Um, determining between two different shades of blue without having an example of both right in front of you would be, you know, with two different sensors, so it would be very difficult. Yeah, and, and so this is one of the things with at least within industrial robotics, right? Like when these things are used outside of the competitive universe, it's a little bit easier for you to be able to have uh, other, you know, pieces of reference. You might not always have uh, connections to some of the, some. you might not always have connections to some of the things um, to be able to know if your values are actually good within the environment that you're actually trying to detect them in, uh, mm -hmm. which can be a little bit of a challenge. Another another kind of general question that we had like um, around the color sensor was around like a cl cl uh, calibration. Uh, and I, mm -hmm. no, I, I think this is kind of where you're getting with the calibration portion of this. Yeah. There really shouldn't be too much of a need to do it if you're programming in the correct way. Am I understanding that correctly? To an extent. M really with calibration, um, it, that really the, like the, the gain value I talked about, that'll be coming out uh, with the 6.0 software, hopefully. Um, for the V3 color sensor, the idea there is is that's your calibration. So um, most of the time, like generally speaking, calibration shouldn't be necessary unless you're maxing out your colors because it, the sensor is being too sensitive and the light is just saying, um, you know, all the colors, <laughs> and not just uh, not just the ones that are actually um, prevalent. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, and one of the other things too is like there were some questions around like when should we use like the range functionality of the color sensor versus using the distance functionality within the two meter distance sensor because that was a new mm -hmm. addition to the kit last oh. year um right yeah those those two sensors have very little overlap uh the color sensor is can do distance but you really only want to use it in not not at more than like six inches um so and with the two-meter distance sensor, that can go up to 1.2 meters. I know we call it the two-meter two distance sensor, but it technically the um, it requires a special mode to go to, to measure two meters, which we don't currently have implemented. Um, like, and it has caveats. Really, it's just assume that it'll work at 1.2 meters, and that should be plenty. Yeah, one of the, one of the other big things is like with with a lot of the sensors, right? We talked about I squared C sensors in particular having drivers for the two-meter distance sensor. Uh, you have three separate modes. One is like a short range mode, one is a medium range mode, and the other one is a long range mode uh, for the full two meters of distance. And so the chip that is on the, the actual sensor itself is capable of doing two meters, but the trade-off within, you know, how accurate that number is, how right. large of it, uh, how big the object that is trying to detect, and a few other things, uh, when we did the implementation for it, it seemed a better choice to be able to do it with 1.2 meters instead of the full two uh, to make it more usable within robotics competitions. Um, yeah, you get a lot more accuracy well is, that way. Yeah, yeah, a lot more accuracy. And the one big thing, like Noah kind of mentioned this, like at least with the color sensor for the range portions in my, my experience has been, I usually have only used it as like, is there a thing here mm -hmm. or is the thing not here? not as a, I am X distance away from whatever thing I'm looking to try to find. That's actually a great point. Um, that kind of sensor is the same kind of sensor that's used in your smartphone up here to tell if, your smart, if the phone's being held up to your ear. It's called a proximity sensor. So that's really its intended use case. Uh, a general idea is something there. It, gives its, it does its best to give you a distance that works OK at short distances. Yeah. So, so those are some things like some of the limitations that you should try to be thinking about as you're trying to use sensors and using them in combination with each other. Um, some of the use cases uh, for the two meter distance sensor are not just how far away uh, you are from an object, but how many objects do you have on hand is another one. One of the cool implementations, at least I saw uh, in the past has been having a two meter distance sensor in an intake or a hopper for, for uh, like, uh, 
the foam balls as an example, and they could know how many of those foam balls you would have in their hopper based on the two meter distance sensor and making some assumptions on the diameter of the ball and where the sensor is located to know what the stack up up to that sensor was. So then they would know when their hopper was full and now it's time to go score basically and have that feedback go back to their driver station. So That's there, the there are some of those cool things that you can use to that. Yeah, so there, there are some cool uses that you can use these sensors for that are a little bit outside of the box um, that are not necessarily uh, baked into the system itself. Um, yeah, that's one of the thing. other questions. People, you know, we got a lot of questions of, you know, what, what's, what are easy sensors, what are hard sensors? Most of these sensors have very, very simple interfaces. It's really a question of what, do, you know, which interfaces, uh, how do you use that data? Like, you can, you know, are, are you, you can do all kinds of interesting things that are way outside the scope of this video if you wanted with some really simple inputs. Um, so the sensors are just about providing those simple inputs and uh, helping you, giving you the data to do whatever you want to do with them. Yeah, and well, and we have a, uh, there's a follow-up question, it looks like coming from Guitar on the distance sensor itself. Um, how do we actually improve the performance with different shapes or like different slope things? So one of the, uh, one of the big things with the two meter distance sensor in particular to keep in mind, and all of these things are inside of data sheets typically for the products themselves. Um, but the two meter distance sensor has like a 20 degree coming out of the sensor port itself. Um, so the further away you go, right, it's basically generating a triangle. So the further this, the closer or further you are away from an object, the bigger the base of the triangle gets. And with that, you need to basically, it, it controls how large of a thing you need to be able to see. So for the full range on a two meter distance sensor, uh, the rough size of it is actually a standard sheet of paper. So either like A4 or an eight and a half inch by 11 inch sheet of paper is kind of the distance and size that it's looking for. So you're looking for something that is relatively large in size um, at a meter and a half away. So detecting smaller objects is definitely a lot more difficult to do mm -hmm. with robotic sensors, which then starts to get into questions of like, you know, utilizing things like vision or utilizing um, even just the driver's own vision to be able to move to an area to be able to pick up and score things in that type of a setup. Yep. Um, yeah, so there, there's a number of things that are always to be considered there. Um, and the two meter distance sensor itself is actually a laser sensor. It is not either infrared or ultrasonic. Um, so it is a, is it a class? I don't know, I think it's a class zero? Uh, I, think the, I feel like the term is class C, but I'm not sure. Is it class one. Uh, cla okay, yeah, class one. Class that's one. Right. That's right. Class um, one. Okay, there we go. <laughs> getting, getting some help from uh, from some chat. Uh, we have a class one sensor, uh, but so it, it is. It is a laser. It is a laser itself. Um, it, I believe, class one is not harmful. Uh, to is not is not a harmful sensor. So that's not part harmful. of the reason why you can't see it. It's basically like it's not there. Um, yeah. yeah, it's in the infrared yeah. wavelength so, too, which uh, contributes to that. Yeah. Um, so and so with 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 the objects, you know, you're just kind of looking for a larger object or a smaller object as you're kind of going. Um, the the only thing with the the square saying like an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper is that's actually what we kind of use. We used a, a for some of our testing to be able to verify what the sizing of it was. Is we were just using some common objects that we had around the office. Um, and one of the bigger ones was something that was about the size of a box. Um, we were using. Uh, from a couple of seasons ago, there were the first global boxes, which were part of the test, uh, the test and verification procedure. And then we just started making those boxes a little bit bigger because they're easier to move a set distance away where balls tend to roll. Um, <laughs> so having, it, it doesn't really matter if it's a square or a circle, um, but it is looking for something that has a relatively large size and that it's that coverage area is being covered uh, right. a, a pretty decent amount by the, by the object you're trying to detect. And that's at the full range. If your object is close, like if you're only me looking to measure an object that's, you know, a few feet away, you know, a meter, uh, or but re less than that, rather, a um, couple of, you know, half a meter or something. Um, in that case, it, it can be, it, like, it'll detect something a little bit smaller. Yeah. No. So th th there, there are 
So that's kind of a little bit of a wrap up on the two meter distance sensor. There are a couple of cool use cases you can have for it. Um, you know, telling how many objects you have, uh, if you if you happen to be able to know the size of the object itself, you know, how far away you are from somebody else. You could utilize it as a, um, like on the top of an arm or on an elevator to know how far away that arm or elevator is relative to space, especially like a floor. Um, if you know that it's not gonna go above 1.2 meters, you can kind of get an idea of what that's gonna look like. Um, so there are a couple of use cases there. One of the other really kind of big topic areas that there were a number of questions on were, how do I get my robot to drive straight? Sure. Um, so, so I'm, I'm actually yes. going to walk you guys through a program that will do that. Um, and at a bigger, a bigger level, really what that kind of what that gets down to is something called state machines. That's a really scary sounding term, I know. Don't, don't get overwhelmed. It's, it's really just saying, keeping track of what your robot is trying to do. So am I, in this case, the only question is, am I trying to drive straight and then some extra data associated with that? So we'll get to that. So in, a, in this program here, we'll start with, um, we're just going to initialize our IMU. The IMU is a sensor that's built into the control hub um, that detects uh, rotation and where it is in physical space, uh, rotationally. Um, so we're going to use that to determine heading. Um, now, our I I'm going to go get the robot real quick. Our, our robot here has the control hub mounted vertically. Um, and so what that means, I'm actually not, rather than providing a parameters variable, I don't actually need to specify any special parameters. So I can just take a IMU BNO55 parameters block that is the name of the IMU, by the way. Um, that's the type of IMU in there. You said if you Google that, you'll find a data sheet that'll give you all sorts of information. Anyway, I can uh, delete this and just provide a new block directly. We don't need to tweak anything on that on the on the parameters. Um, now we're going to need to set up a new a few variables. So I th I think some of these I'm going to explain as I get to them. Let's delete this parameters variable. We'll create a new one and we'll call it is direction correction active. All right. And but note that this is all going before wait for start. This IMU initialize will take a couple of seconds, so you really want to do that. A, while the robot is still, and B, while your robot, before you're in the heat of a match trying to uh, do this. Um, so, and state machines are extra powerful in the context of teleop because in teleop, it's not just, you, you, don't, you can't t just say, keep doing this thing. You can't like devote your entire control to this one element because you have to be able to keep driving. You have to be able to keep looking at your game pads. You have to do a bunch of things at once. And state machines are a great way to do that. Um, so uh, set direction, is direction corrective active? That's going to be either true or false. Um, so go into logic, and here we have a true block, which we can also select false. So here it's going to be false. Um, so a lot, uh, really a lot of programming and programming well is about managing your state. It's about keeping track of what your program does and what, these, uh, what the values of all your variables are. If you, if you don't focus on that, it's very, very easy to, um, to get confused and to have to debug a program. So we always have to make sure that is direction corrective active has the right state. So we'll get to that. Um, another thing we need to do is reverse our right motor. So we're going to go actuator DC motor and set the direction to reverse. Um, and we'll do that for the right motor. Um, that's because most of you probably know this, but you have two motors that are flipped from each other, so one of them has to get reversed. And on this robot, that's the right one. Um, so another thing, that another variable that we're going to need to keep track of is where we are pointed. So I'm going to make another variable called uh, heading, like a compass. Um, we're going to start with just setting the heading to zero. And to get a zero block, it's under math, it's number, and there's that. You can type whatever number you want in there. It's already zero. Um, 
So once, we, once the program actually starts, we're going to be running code every loop. So anytime you're doing teleop code, it's really important to make sure that your code goes inside this loop and that you don't put any loops inside here that are going to go for a while, because then you'll block all of your other code. Again, you want the code, each loop to run as quickly as possible and to do as, you, you just do what you do and update, um, send commands to update the robot state as necessary. Um, so in this loop, one of the first things we need to do is get the heading. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to get a variable block for set heading, put that inside of our loop. We'll delete this comment. Um, and then we're going to do uh, sensors, bn05i and u, and get uh, angular orientation. Nope, get a good orientation. That's it. Okay. Um, so this, this block will get our orientation, but we can't feed this directly into heading because it actually contains several. What, what, what this is really returning is one of these uh, orientation blocks, an orientation object, so to speak. Um, so what we want is to get um, oh yeah there we go first angle so this is going to have an, or an orientation has three angles your your x axis or your y axis and your uh, your z axis um, I probably have those mixed up as far as um, specifics but I wasn't you know wasn't thinking about that um, so we're at, instead of using an orientation variable, we're just going to feed this right in there. Um, so we want to get, for this rope, when, you're, when your um, control hub is mounted vertically like this, you want to get uh, the angles in an order of z, y, x. So that means the first angle will be z, the second angle will be y, and the third angle will be x. Um, and we want z, uh, again, when, you, when your hub is mounted like this, the z-axis is the one that turns like this. Um, so we, and so we're doing first angle, and the first one here is z, which means it will be the z-axis, and so that, so that now this is our heading. So every loop, we set the heading to that, and we have an active heading. After that, we, um, we're going to look at our joysticks. What is, so let's talk about the behavior we want. Um, if the user is turning or reversing or um, ha is driving one motor faster than the other, or is even if they're just um, doing, like say they're driving at the halfway point of the joystick, um, in that case it's pretty safe to assume that the user is, uh, that your driver is trying to do precise control. And in that case, let's not apply any sort of special, um, let's not do, uh, you know, this direction correction. Let we just let them directly do that. Um, so, but to determine that, we need to get those joystick values. So we'll do that. Um, we're going to actually make a two new variables, one for the left joystick and one for the right joystick. So right power and left power. And the reason I'm calling it power is because we're, we're going to end up changing. Uh, if, if we're applying direction correction, we're going to tweak these values. But at the end of the day, that they are going to be set to the motor powers. So that's really what these are. So initially, we assume that the power is going to just be the joysticks, and then we can change it later during the loop if we need to. So we're going to call set left power. Um, actually, oops, I put that outside the loop. See how easy it is? Got to be careful. Inside the loop, we're going to call set left power. And we're going to get gamepad, left stick y, keeping in mind that um, the, game, the, the uh, y axis on the gamepads, up and down, is actually reversed. So up is a negative number and down is a positive number. That's not what we want, so we're going to use the math block and this uh, negative to swap it around. So now it's up, we'll store a positive value in left power. And I'm just I'm going to select it and then do Control C and Control V, and that'll paste the whole thing. And I can do set this to right power, 
minus game pat equals negative um, right stick y. Again, y is that vertical axis. Okay, so we have our gamepad values. So let, let's do that detection of whether we want to do um, uh, direction correction or not. So the way we do that is that we use an if block. And we're actually going to do an if else if block. And you'll see why soon. So if the left power or the right power is less than not 0.9, because it's a value from negative 1 to 1, um, if, it's, if it's outside of that range, then we want to, um, then we should just let the user do, you know, drive however they want and not apply any software correction on top of that. So let's check for that condition. So we do logic. Um, so we'll, what we want here is an or. So this is a block that lets us put a couple of conditional blocks and bind them together with an and or an or. We want or. If the um, right power, so variables, right power, or left power. Um, we also need another logic block for a comparison. And the default's equals, but we can just select less. Um, so if the left power is less than, and again, we need another number block here for math, 0.9. Or, and I'm going to copy this whole thing, paste. I believe you can also do that with, by right-clicking, and then you can click Duplicate, and that will do the same thing. Um, or the right power. If either, the only, so that will make it so that the only condition where this activates is if both sticks are maxed out. Um, you can, of course, change that if you want to activate it to activate sooner, but I wouldn't really recommend it. Um, so if either of those things is true, then we definitely want um, to set is heading correction active to false. And that's going to be under logic. So we ensure as the, the instant that the user's um, joystick drops below 0.9, we stop applying any correction. If it's now, if it's not, um, if, if it if, it, if both sticks are stuck up, we have no, now this else if block says do another check in that case to see if something else should be done. Um, so what we want to do is behave differently depending on whether it was whether this is direction corrective access was already set to false or not. Sorry, already set to true. Um, so if is direction corrective active and you, that's a boolean value, that means true or just just true or false. We can plug it directly into an if. If the direction correction is active, um, then we uh, actually, so if the direction corrective I correction is active, we're done. Um, we don't need to change anything else with it within this if block. We'll, we'll do more processing later, of course. Um, but if it's not, so what we want is um, uh, this not block in under logic. If it's not active, that means that we have just entered direction correct, the direction correction state. And that's, a, that, that's one of the key things about state machines. You, need, you, have to, you, want, you want a behavior that, ha that occur is occurring while a particular state is true, but you also need to watch the transition. So we are transitioning into a new state. What does that mean? So when, we tr when the robot's driving along, um, and you and it gets pegged, and both uh, both sticks get pegged to full. Then you we want to start going the current direction we're going. So we need to record the heading of that moment of time. If we keep updating the heading as we go, it'll it won't actually correct anything. It'll just say, oh, I, I should keep going at the at the current heading. We want to say, go to the heading that you saw when you first engaged um, direction correction mode. So. Um, what we want to do is have a new variable, and we're going to call that um, desired heading. All right. Now I'm I'm going to come back up here and set. We should start with this at zero. I'm going to duplicate this block, 
And then here, I'm going to set desired heading to the current heading, which we've already updated previously in loop. In the loop. So when you engage the mode, it says, OK, I'm going to start tracking this direction. And the other thing we need to do is, of course, set is direction active to true. I'm going to, oops, I'm going to select this block and duplicate it. All right, and now uh, we're going to set that to true. So now that should be with that. If uh, if this is not true, like when, when we get down to this final else, we don't need to do anything. That means that is direction is corrected is at, is already active. We don't need to change anything else in this if block. OK, um, so the next thing we need to do is determine how far we are off of our desired heading. So we do that by subtracting. So, and we're going to store that in another variable called heading error. Again, uh, this, one we don't want, this one we don't need to initialize because it's going to get initialized before we use it. Um, I'm going to set heading error after this if else, because this, oops, um, the, the reason we're not putting any more logic in this if is because this logic is going to be shared between this condition where we're transitioning um, to direction correction um, and this condition where we're already in it. So we're sharing that so that it comes out here. So set heading error to, and we're going to grab a uh, math minus block, and it's going to be the heading. I'm going to duplicate a heading block and duplicate it again and switch it to desired heading. So heading minus desired heading. Um, and that says, what's that? And that's just how far are we off from the, from the direction that we want to be going. Now, um, I'm going to make a new function, partially to demo functions and also just to help keep the program cleaner. You, uh, too many times I've seen uh, blocks programs that are just a straight mass of code and you can't tell what's going on because you completely lose all context of what if statement you're in and that kind of thing. So when you have a, a good chunk of logic, it should go into functions so that you can read the program much more easily. So this is going to be apply direction correction. Um, and we'll, we'll fill that in later. But for now, let's just say what this, fu we'll this function is going to do is, is it's going to change left power and right power to what they should be to keep the robot going straight. So we want to, and we only want to run this if, Um, direction correction is active. So if the direction correction is active, then we call apply direction correction. It makes a new block for this function. And this will run whatever code is located up here. Um, so that's going to, again, we'll, we'll implement that in a minute. Um, that's going to change left and right power. So after that's done, we can s use left and right power. So we're going to do motor actuators, DC motor, and then dual, and then set power. So the left motor needs to be left power. And the right motor needs to be right power. All right, so now this apply direction correction. How is this going to work? How do we drive straight? So the robot is, what we want to do is not limit the power too much. Like, um, it, and so whichever side is going is, we, we need to, s I'll turn the robot so it's like this. If the robot is going in this direction, it's kind of steering this way, then what we need to do is slow down this pair of wheels 
so that this one has a chance to catch up and keep the robot straight. So, which, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new variable called uh, motor speed adjustment. And we're only going to use that in this apply direction correction thing. Um, by the way, uh, if we're running a little low on time, so I'm not going to do this. Um, in a real program to help you debug this, you would absolutely want to print all of these variables to telemetry so that you can keep track of the state of your program. Again, that's so important for debugging. You have to know the state of your program. It's easy to get confused and have something in a state that you didn't mean it to be in. Um, telemetry is a great way to keep track of that. But for now, we won't, do we won't bother with that. Um, we're going to set the motor speed adjustment um, to the absolute value. Noah? Yeah. While you're well, working, uh, we actually do have we do have we actually do have a good amount of time, so feel free to take your time and work through what you, what you need to. Um, yeah. So if you okay. if you uh, sh showing the telemetry in particular, I think is going to be a very uh, sure. the debugging process. It seems to be um, from reading in the chat here, it seems like the debugging process itself and trying to figure out where errors could potentially be arising in people's code that. That's one of those invisible things that you know can potentially come to bite you while you're, especially as you're starting to get, getting learning. So we have, I, yeah. we have the time. Might, okay. might as well take it yeah, and do this thing right. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I'll take a minute then and show under utilities we have this telemetry section, um, and th there are a couple of different ones here. Honestly, I recommend like the simplest thing is just always use the one that is telemetry add data that takes a key and a text. So the key is just going to watch is a label that's going to show up with a colon in front of it before the actual data. Um, so if we call so if at the end of our loop before telemetry.update, which is important, um, if we say left power, or yeah, left power, and then copy one of these variables there, it'll show us the left power of the um, of the robot that, that's being implemented, so we can see what's being done. Up here, we can you know, log this motor speed adjustment, make sure that value looks like what we'd expect. Um, real, and really, when you're doing all these variables, it's important to not, like, don't just think through what you want your program to do before you write it. You know, I'm able to write this program because I've literally written it before. Um, uh, but when if I, were, if I hadn't gone through this before, the first thing I would be doing is sketching out what I want my program to do, how I'm going to keep track of each state, and uh, making sure that I understand what state the program should be in at, a, at any time. And then if I see in the telemetry that it's deviated from that, I'll know I'm doing something wrong in the code somewhere. So we're going to log the left power. Uh, we should log our heading. So I'm just going to copy paste this whole thing. Um, And then we'll select heading. Copy paste that all. And then we'll make this um, heading error. We'll do one for uh, is direction correction active. Um, and then up here, we're also going to, obviously, we have to implement it first, but we're all, we'll, we will also log motor speed adjustment. And that will, because it's only called when this function is updated, um, it won't, um, mo unless, unless we're in that mode, it's not going to show up, which is fine. It doesn't really affect other modes. So anyway, um, so the motor speed adjustment, we're going to say, uh, is the absolute value. And if you don't know what absolute value is, it means uh, just the positive, like the positive version of the number. So for example, if the number is negative 0.5, the absolute value is positive 0.5. If the number is positive 0.5, it's still po positive 0.5. It only turns things positive. Um, so we're going to do the absolute value of the heading error. So the amount of motor adjustment is not dependent on 
um, on whether the, head, uh, the, um, the heading error is positive or negative, you know, whether we're going left or right. Um, so we're going to set the absolute variables um, and then heading error. And then subtract that. So actually, this goes in um, um, here. And sorry, I did not mean subtract, I meant divide. So another thing you have to keep track of prog when programming and doing math is units. So the, the idea is that the more off course we are, the, the higher difference of the speed we want to do. Um, so let's say that we're one degree off, you know, a tiny little bit. Um, our, our whole motor range is, like, it maxes out at one. So if we, if we just, you know, set the adjustment to the, uh, to directly the error, what will, will actually happen is that it'll stop. Like, so it'll be literally jerking back and forth as one motor stops. So we have to divide it and make it way smaller. Um, the value I found that worked really well for this robot is 15. This will vary a little bit per robot. Um, but 15 uh, takes it from a degree to a tenth of a degree and even less. Or so, uh, so that your value is, so if you're a degree off, now you're going at like 10%, uh, you know, 10, 15% less power, which is a much more reasonable value and will keep the robot driving smoothly. Um, this is a pretty slow robot, though, so I could demo it more easily. Um, your robot will probably need another value for that. Um, so once we have this value, I'm gonna we're gonna log it like the others. So we'll do telemetry .add data. motor speed adjustment. All right, and now. The final thing is to apply that to whichever motor it is affects. So if, so we're going to do an if else. If the heading error and we're going to need a comparison, so that's here. Um, also, I'm realizing this is probably a little bit small. Sorry about that. All right. If the m if the heading error, um, oops, I put that in the wrong spot. If the heading error is l greater than or equal to zero, let's copy this. Oops. If the heading error is positive, more than zero. Um, then that means that the robot uh, is go is pointing um, the way that the way the math works out uh, with this program. If the heading error is zero, then the motor needs to turn right more. It is pointing a little bit left. So we're going to set the left motor um, all the way to one. We're going to keep that at max. So again. Variables, and we're going to set the left power to 1. I'll copy this block. Okay, and then the right power, we're going to do 1. Uh, I'm going to do some math, subtract. So it's going to be 1. Oh Convenient, it has a one for me. A one minus this motor speed adjustment. So the left power is going to uh, is going to stay at full, um, and the right is going to slow down just a little bit, depending on how far it is. You know, if, if it's if it's if the robot's th all way over here, it's actually going to apply quite a lot of power, uh, or it's going to slow down the right quite a lot um, to get back. So we're going to slow that down, and then we're going to basically copy these two blocks and reverse them. So the right power is going to be 1, and the left power is going to be uh, 1 minus the motor speed adjustment. 
And that's it. This is the entire program. Um, by the way, we the first the and I don't know that the first global uh, software had this feature, but you can now see the Java version of your code as you write it, uh, which is really cool and is gr a great way to transition and learn Java. See how this stuff maps. Like if you want to learn how to do something new, you can do it in blocks where you're familiar, and then see what that changes in your Java code. But anyway, um, here is our our blocks program. Um, we're applying direction correction, and then we're taking those power values that we change and applying them to our motors. So let's, let's save this program and give it a shot. So I'm going to unplug the driver station phone from the computer and hook it up to a gamepad. There we go. Press start A to hook it up. And select our playground teleop. I'm going to take this robot switch it over here. And now if I press play, oops, I can drive the robot around. Oh. Okay, so you saw that. There was some kind of bug somewhere. That's useful. So individually it works fine. But when I try to do in drive both forwards and engage the uh, engage um, the driver correct the direction correction mode, something goes wrong. So if I look at telemetry, and unfortunately I can't show the telemetry on screen right now, um, but so shows that the hmm. okay now it's working. I don't know. Um, th there's some bug in there. Uh, I have a I have a working version of the code actually that I will show on screen so that you can look at uh, look at that. Um, I will okay that it's enabled now. Um, no, that's probably different. DS for drive straight. I'm gonna enable that so I can run that and show you. Uh, here's a look at the code for this. Um, I'm sure there's some tiny little thing that I got wrong. Perfectly normal. I definitely met when I wrote the original version of this program. You know, I had a few. There were a few times that happened, and that's that's never a reason to give up. That's a reason to dive into your code and see what what assumption you made, what what just what mistake you made. Um, all right. So here's a here's here's the other version. Um, okay. Real quick, I need to restart the robot. Um, I got the problem with IMU error, which some of you have probably seen before, and we are actively looking into. Uh, that will hopefully be fixed soon. So the IMU, like a lot of the other sensors, like our two meter distance sensor and a few others, is also an I squared C device. So it does have a built in driver uh, that is built in with the software development uh, kit and the APK, the, app, the robot controller application. So these things can get updated uh, over time. So when issues do arise, letting us know is a great way for us to be able to start investigating and figuring out Absolutely. to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, it's very helpful when you guys let us know what issues you see. So, uh, the robot's back up, we see a green light, so I'm going to drive straight, and you can see that it drives nice and straight. And I'm going to demonstrate what, how unstraight it would drive if I didn't have that in, that in place by driving backwards. Because, remember, we only engage it when both sticks are pointed all the way up at point 0.9. If it's a negative point 0.9, we're not doing an absolute value for that check, so that code, that, uh, the code won't engage when you're driving backwards. So if I'm driving backwards, it is veering very, very heavily. But when I drive straight forwards, it drives very straight because our code is engaged. So it works. Um, I just I made some, some little uh, thing. So I'll, again, you can take a screenshot of that and uh, of yeah, there you go, um, and see what was the what was the issue there. So there's a couple of questions that are in chat that are kind of follow ups on some of these, okay. which is you know what uh, programs that are already made beforehand uh, that are like code examples and things along those lines that are able to be shared. 
And so with this program in particular, we're probably going to do a little bit more uh, cleanup to make sure that it kind of has some comments in it to be able to explain mm -hmm. some of the things that are being done. Uh, but we can work on that to be able to get this specific example out there. Yeah. Um, there are some code examples that are also built in the SDK um, that are continuing to grow, mm -hmm. correct? No, I yes, think there are a couple of them that just, there, there are a few that just do basic, you know, like here, here's how the sensor works. Um, so, yeah, th th this is a bit of a different list than what was in the first global software, but these are all the block sample programs that are in the, uh, in the software for, to show different things you can do with blocks. Um, yep, and so, and, and go on. Yeah, and so there, there, there are going to be versions that are within the control hubs that you have if you're running the first global software that already have some examples on how to be how to run them. Um, when we're, we also have some of our documentation uh, has moved online to docs.revrobotics.com, um, and we have some further examples for some of the different sensors and for other things that we're going to continue to add um, over the next couple of months and the years to come as well. Um, so we're going to have these uh, this ability to be able to share things through. Uh, that type of a nature. Um, the big thing with code that we try to share, right, is Noah's able to be on hand to explain how a lot of this stuff works um, right now. But uh, the best way of being able to look at code is code that is actually well documented and well commented. Um, so then you're able to understand how it works and then apply those lessons to something else. Because having a robot that just drives straight is really, really helpful and useful. Um, but now we need to have it where it's able to drive forward straight, but also backward straight. Well, now how do we solve that problem um, is, right. is the next step, right? Yeah. Um, and another point on that uh, with, you know, building on this program and adapting your own. So this is the real power of state machines, is that I am not looping anywhere, doing any special loops. I am, I'm just, everything is in my main loop. So you can imagine if I also have, say, a thing that reads the potentiometer um, to, you know, and is looking for a particular voltage from the potentiometer that knows it means that this spot, um, then what it, then I can run the code that checks the state of this, you know, right after apply direction correction. So like, it, for example, if, if it, it's supposed to hold itself at a certain point while you hold down a button, you can say, if this button's being held down, do this thing. And you, because of the programming style, um, it's not interfering any other part of your code from working. So that, that's the real power of, of state machines. And it allows you to also have a really iterative process, right? So you're able to go from state to state to state instead mm -hmm. of going through and having to you, right. you can be able to easier find issues because you know that you're having a problem with this state versus having a problem with the whole rest of your code. So if you have everything in like one giant sequence of loop, like it's just one giant loop, it's going to take all that time to execute that loop over and over and over again. And you might have an error that is being built up through multiple runs of a loop. You can end up having issues mm -hmm. where you can't get out of your loop, so you have stuck in loop errors. Um, right. It's just a lot neater, cleaner way of organizing your code. Yeah, and and the other and th you actually hit another point. We, here, this example has only two states. Is it on or is it off? You can have, what well, you can also do, uh, and this is a little harder in blocks because um, it's just a number, but what you could do, oops, microphone fell off. Um, <laughs> what you can do is have your, um, save your state in a, as a number and have five states. So if the state is one, we're do this thing. If the state is two, do this thing. Um, and and write, write your code that way. Um, that will probably be unnecessary for most things you do. And again, because so much of programming is about, keep, is about managing state, it's within your best interest to keep your state as simple as possible. You know, I have a set number of variables. I, none of them I can get rid of. They're all necessary. And um, it, I really kept to its bare bones here. You really want to do that instead of uh, just Adding a variable, adding variables that you don't really need. Yep, and that's that. I, I think that for the most part, that kind of wraps up a little bit on the state machine. One of the other questions that we had that came in through the form, but also through chat, is how do we have access to different coding platforms if you don't have access to a co uh, control hub? So sure. there are yeah. there are a number of tools for this, right, Noah? There's a number of tools for this, and a great way that you can see them is to go to first.global slash resources. 
And uh, the first global has compiled a great list here. Um, uh, there's a special, there's a sections for all sorts of stuff. But um, of course, here we care more about programming. So lots, all, all these different um, coding platforms are ones where you can learn, uh, learn different, uh, this different types of code and work on, and they don't require robots. Um, MIT App Inventor is relatively, it, it's relatively based on similar code to what we're using for blocks in, uh, in, in first. Um, so that might feel, again, vaguely familiar. It's, it is different, um, but it's probably the closest of these, that and Scratch. But yeah, so there, uh, lots there are of good, a number lots of good resources. Yeah, a number of resources. And the same thing as this is true, so our next session uh, is going to be on CAD, and there's also the same. It's the same type of thing with computer-aided design. There are a number of resources on how to be able to do design when you don't have access to physical parts. Um, you can design in the virtual world. You can program in the virtual world, uh, and being able to then use those skills while the code itself might not be applicable or the design itself might not be applicable. The skills that you learn are going to be uh, ready to go. Yep. <laughs> yep. And I think with that, we can say hi hello back to Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. We'll see you next month for the computer aided design session. Yep. And we'll we'll look forward to seeing everybody then. Um, but for now, I think that that that's it for us here uh, here in Texas. And we'll see you guys all next time. Bye.